Cambridge. That's at the other end uh, of the scale. Now, crucially, is coupled with one of the slowest rates of wage growth, with the latest data showing that there is actually negative real wage growth. So that's once you've stripped inflation out of minus 6.6%. Here. So prices going up, real wages going down, you can see what happens. And the relative child poverty rate as well, I always think this is a very stark measure. That stands at 31% here, more than one in three children in, in poverty. That compares to 18.7% for the UK as a whole. That's according to House of Commons library data. Well, we're joined now here uh, by Pastor Mick Fleming. Now, he moved away from a previous life of crime. He got himself ordained and here on the streets of Burnley, founded church on the street where we're spending the day here to try and make a difference to his hometown. We also have James Foy, who also turned his life around, partly uh, through meeting Mick, wasn't it? And uh, set up Curry on the Street, which has now provided over 40,000 hot meals to people people here in need. A very good morning to both of you and thank you very much for having us. Uh, Pastor Mick, you are a Burnley, Burnley man, aren't you? Born and bred. You've been doing this for some 10 years now. Yeah. What has the last year been like? It's been really difficult. So it's been far more difficult than when we were in the Covid days because there was uh, an openness for people to donate and to help and a camaraderie. But the economy is so deflated that people just don't have the ability to give in the same way. So charities are really, really struggling. So it's been really, really difficult. So the need is rising, but the resource is, is falling. You know, so, it, so it's, been, it's been an horrendous, really, 12 months. Uh, and the levels of poverty that we see that James will tell you about, you know, you know children on the street, hungry, uh, the parents really, really, really struggling, uh, coming to get the help and the support, and then our resources are limited, you know, we, we do the best that we can, but the questions are, should charities be picking this up? We are, but should they? And for me, I like to see a budget that supports organisations like James's and organisations like ours, you know, and uh, I think helps around... Uh, uh, you look at them figures, you talked about child poverty there, 31%. And a national average, more than one in three children. You know, you know, where's the justice in that? And then you look at the terrace properties around this area, this is the inflation rates, this is why we are inflation. So they're not uh, adequately insulated because of lack of government support th down the years. So it costs you more to heat your house. You, I know you see about 1,200 people a week yeah. coming in here. One of the attractions, of course, we can smell it here. Uh, it's the fresh food being cooked, um, yeah. homemade food being cooked in the kitchen there. But, James, you're also helping out with this need, aren't you? So, so you, you were on hard times yourself. You saw what it was all about, and you decided to try and help other people. And you take curry to people around the area, don't yes, you? Just tell yeah. us what you're seeing. Right, well... The poverty-wise, I've seen it growing and growing and growing over the last few months especially. Um, and what we try and do now is, is give them a curry, give them a hot meal and give them a bag of shopping with the essentials in. But what I worry about is the children as well. We're, we're trying to educate the children with the parents to come out, help these people that are vulnerable you know, if they're not so vulnerable, they can help. And we, we try and get them to help and then go into the schools and all that. We want to learn them while they're young to respect these people and stuff. You know, the vulnerable get a bad time. And, and you said they're coming out of dark, cold houses and standing in queues for an hour or two to get some food for their parents. In the snow, Thursday, when it was snow on Thursday night, um, we had about 70 people there. They'd been there quite a long time. We were absolutely freezing, but we managed to get a little donation so we could get some sleeping bags for the guys that were sleeping rough. Um, and we have to pick them out, you know, we have to pick these guys out. Um, I'm, I'm so worried about them because, like Mick says, we haven't got the funding 
we haven't got that funding to, to uh, help everybody. So this is why they're coming down, queuing up, getting in the queue a couple hours before, in the freezing cold with babies in the prams, you know, and uh, there were one woman there with a baby in her arms, a young, probably a month old, you know, and it's, it, uh, it's heartbreaking. Yeah. It really is heartbreaking. So when you hear about levelling up, doesn't feel like that to you here in Burnley? No, no. No, it, it's, um, it's a shock to me, to be honest. It's, it's got worse and worse, you know. Um, when I first started in Burnley, I, I started through Mick, really. I, I went and had a meeting with him and um, I said, can I do out to help? And he, he showed me where to go and where to set up. And, and that was like four years ago. Now, from then, I was doing about 12 curries a week. Now we're doing 300 curries. All so staffed by volunteers? Maybe. All done by volunteers. Um, we can't afford to pay anybody. We, c we, we can't afford it. We need people, but we need, like, a manager. We can't... I'm, I'm not going to get the manager, and I'm not going to get a proper driver. I've had to stop driving because I'm going blind. But... I can't afford to pay a driver and I can't get funding and it's little things like that that stop you, stop you doing your best, you so, know. So if you were to hear one thing from the Chancellor today that you would think that is just what we need, would it be about the children? What, what would it be about? It'll be about the children but it's not just the one thing, I can't, I can't leave it at that, but it'll be about the organisations getting what yeah. they need. Yeah. You know, we do need money, we do... Uh, we don't do it for money, but we need the money coming in okay. to All carry right. on. Well, um, it, it's eye-opening coming to talk to you and the work that you do here in Burnley. We're going to be watching uh, the budget here, what the Chancellor has to offer for the people uh, of Burnley here, and we'll be bringing you analysis and, indeed, the thoughts of some of the people here who are coming in to see, <clears throat> to get what they need from the Church on the Streets uh, Ministry. Do get in touch with us because we want to hear your thoughts as well on the budget. Uh, what do you want to see from the Chancellor? Are you expecting Jeremy Hunt's announcements to help you deal with the cost of living crisis? Do get in touch. You can call us now on 0208 167 2200 to be part of a special phone-in programme. That's to have your say. Of course, that's what it's all about. We want to hear from you and you can ask our experts any questions you might have. You can watch the budget, your say, that's at 7pm this evening, right here on Sky News. Uh, back to you, Sophie. Thanks very much, Sam. Well, there'll be lots more from uh, Burnley as we try and work out exactly how the Chancellor's measures impact people across the country. We've got a bit of a flavour of it already, haven't we? Beth, I want to talk to you about the childcare. Mm. Um, well, I should say announcement, but it was more of a leak, right? Uh, one of the rabbits escaping I from the hat. It, I think it might have been a rabbit that escaped due to the good work of the uh, great yeah. people at The Guardian, actually. Quite unusual. Um, but it's one of those things where, look, it's probably the age I am, but my WhatsApp groups are absolutely <laughs> lighting up over this um, policy. It is a quite a big deal for some people. It is a massive deal, and I was once that soldier with, with toddlers and, and paying for two <laughs> lots of childcare, and it is extremely expensive when you're in um, that spot in your life. And, um, yes, so... Uh, a, bit, a big bit of a rabbit here is this um, free childcare announcement we're expecting for one and two years old. Now, as you will well know, the government already has a policy of up to 30 hours of free childcare a week for three and four year olds before they go uh, to primary school. Uh, and now they're looking at extending that. Now, when I was in that focus group in Wickham last week, you heard Charlotte, we had her at the top of the programme. For working parents, childcare and the cost of it is a very immediate and pressure issue for cost of living. We think that the chance is going to expand provision to one and two year olds. Um, that policy was actually costed at about six billion pounds. It looks like the money the Treasury are going to put in 
uh, today is about four billion pounds, which raises obvious questions to me. Mm. Well, I think I know. So, so part of the part of the explanation behind that, again, you know, after waiting to the numbers is is it's a called a dynamic scoring and so right. it should cost six billion pounds but then they expect the economy to do a bit better to the tune of bringing in an extra two billion pounds so in net terms it does end up at four billion pounds. and is that because you're basically encouraging people back to work who yeah. might not so be able to work exactly. because of the cost of child it's got this it's got these twin kind of goals hasn't it what, what are we facing at the moment a lot of people economic inactivity has gone up enormously actually again sorry i've got another chart about that so if we bring it up we can we can, we can show you economic inactivity has gone up really sharply uh, around the country mm. and part of what we're seeing here look at that line there particularly particularly the bit on the far right hand side yeah. where it's going up so since the pandemic that's a lot of people just not going back into the workplace mm. whether it's people who have children who, who are working from home or indeed not able to work from home or whether it's pensioners so yeah. so part of part of this is coming mm. back to that yeah and um, actually there's 1.1 million vacancies in the job market at the moment because of partly brexit and uh, you know migration that's a big issue uh, and so the government want to try and get economically inactive people back into work so at one end of the scale there's childcare support at the other end of the scale and I think this could potentially be quite a controversial policy we're expecting uh, the government to lift the lifetime allowance on pension funds. Now, at the moment, it's capped at one million. So once your pension fund hits one million quid, you can't keep putting money into it. We think they're going to lift the cap maybe to up to 1.8 million. I don't need to tell you with those figures that this only affects a small percentage yeah. of people in society. What, why are they doing it? Well, they're looking at trying to bring professionals in their 50s, particularly in medicine, uh, they're trying to incentivize them to get back into work because they think, <coughs> I've maxed out my pension, I'm now being taxed more on my income, do I need to work when also I've got this massive pot of money to enjoy an early retirement? But I think that the risk politically of that is, say, that's a £2 billion policy, that's a £2 billion policy very much directed at a very narrow group of people who are very, very wealthy already. So I'm interested to see how that looks on the scorecard. But what you see in it, Sophie, is, you know, help for parents to incentivise elderly and then with universal credit as well, more support for childcare payments for those on universal credit. The other thing they're going to do is, is reduce the ratios. Now, this is the rules around um, <coughs> how many carers do you need to look Do you need to look after how many toddlers in a in a childcare setting? Um, and it used to be one one in you know one adult for four three year olds, and they might loosen that ratio to say one adult in five. And the reason that matters is, of course, if they're looking after more children, then it drives down the cost. That also raises questions about you know childcare standards. Mm -hmm. But this is a whole package about getting people back into work. Another critical problem of this, Ed, as you will know, is that it. NHS waiting lists are causing a problem with economic inactivity because hundreds of thousands of people are on NHS waiting lists and can't go back to work until uh, they're better. And so this all feeds into also trying to cut waiting lists in the NHS. And this is a big job for Mel Stride, the uh, Work and Pensions Secretary of State. And we don't have long left, but Ed, how much of a problem is economic inactivity for the economy? It's, I mean, this, this is one of the big issues in the UK. Most other countries around the world, OK, when you look at the chart we just showed you, you don't see quite such a big increase in economic inactivity. People have been coming back and it's, you know, there's all sorts of reasons behind why it is, you know, people choosing not to work in, in some cases, but also people having been long, having long term sickness. So there is there is a long shadow from COVID-19, both for things like long COVID, but also for other uh, issues that weren't necessarily treated as a result of the, the lockdowns and, and the shutdowns that we had. So that that you kind know, of solving that as far as the Treasury is concerned, as far as uh, mm. Rishi Zunak is concerned, is one of the big answers towards kind of getting us back towards some sort of health and uh, economic health as well as, as, as the kind of general public. And so that, that's a big deal. Yeah, I remember when I, when I interviewed the Chancellor on Sunday, that was the thing he wanted to talk about when I said, what, what's the, what should we expect from the budget? This was it. Uh, lots more analysis from uh, Beth and Ed coming up.
now. Now, the budget decisions being made this afternoon are all been taken on a day of major strikes as hundreds of thousands of workers walk out in action, which impacts the country's schools, hospitals, underground trains and civil service as well. Well, Scott, as Porter joins us now from outside the department for levelling up in Westminster, where workers are on strike. Alice, are we expecting anything uh, about this issue in the budget? Well, I think the civil servants who are behind me are very keen to see what we'll hear from the budget. They're one of 100 government organisations which are going on strike today. We heard from representatives from the PCS union who are warning that strike action may continue until the end of the year unless their demands are met by the government. Now, I've just come from a picket line in East London where teachers are going on strike. Now, they're wanting a pay rise above in line with inflation. Now, Gillian Keegan has put forward a 3% pay rise and they're saying, that is not enough. I think the real difficulty is how fractured it has become across the United Kingdom where we see strike action with teachers has been paused in Wales because they've got a new offer made and it's been called off in Scotland. So there's pressure there on Gillian Keegan to solve the issue there. And today is also the third day of junior doctor strikes. They make up around 40% of the medical workforce. To have them going on strike for three consecutive days, today is the last day, is of course having an enormous impact on the NHS. There's good news at least is that strike action by ambulance workers and nurses has paused for the moment while talks are ongoing. But to have 40% of your workforce impacted in the way is of course highly significant. And then here in London, it's very much uh, at a standstill because we've got members of the RMT and ASLEF union who are striking on the London underground. They're having an enormous impact. And many of these groups are all wanting a pay rise in line with inflation. They're struggling with the cost of living. But in terms of where this puts Jeremy Hunt is going to be really interesting because he's under pressure to bring inflation down. And he said he doesn't want to entrench high levels of inflation. But many people across the public sector are struggling with the high cost of living at the moment. And we'll certainly be very much hoping from Jeremy Hunt's budget that there'll be something in it for them to make their standard of living better. Thanks very much uh, indeed. Lots of strikes today, uh, many of them, of course, uh, completely unresolved, expecting more uh, in schools and on our transport networks too. We've been talking a bit about how the budget is likely to impact people's finances, uh, whether that is pension plans, whether it's childcare. Let's bring in our household finance expert, Greg Marsh, uh, shall we? And Greg, this is really what I think most of our viewers really want to know about. How is the budget going to affect them? Exactly. Well, we know the Chancellor's talking about the impact on the UK economy, but what we care about is the impact on UK households. We woke this morning to some good news for householders, which is that the energy price guarantee is indeed going to be frozen at the current level of £2,500 for another three months. Energy prices have soared over the last few months, as we all know. We were expecting, until that was confirmed, that energy price guarantee would rise it now will not rise, and indeed most analysts are now predicting that by the middle of this year, July onwards, energy prices will fall still further. So, energy prices, good news for households. More uncertainty about income tax. Now, while we're not expecting to see any rise in the headline rates of income tax, we do know that the average rate of tax, the effective rate of tax that we all pay, has increased over the last few years. And unless the government today, unless the Chancellor unfreezes income tax thresholds, this is effectively a sort of stealth tax. If income tax thresholds stay constant, even though earnings are increases, we're all paying effectively a bit more tax. So working families, people on uh, uh, incomes, especially higher incomes, will be watching to see very closely about income tax thresholds. Now, those on lower incomes and dependent on government support have other things to worry about. And in particular, they'll be looking to see whether the rate of universal credit increases in line with inflation, whether disability living allowance or personal independence payments increases in line with inflation, and whether we see the winter fuel payment continue. So again, very big difference depending on your income level and your household composition. During the course of today, we are going to be talking to a number of householders around the UK to understand what the budget means for them. And we're going to be looking in detail at those households. But let's have a look at Leanne. So Leanne is a self-employed mum. She has a four-year-old daughter. Her daughter too old to benefit from the additional childcare support that's been rumoured over the last day or two that might, we might see at lunchtime. 
Linda. Linda is a retired occupational therapist. While Linda's husband does work, Linda is dependent on pension and disability support. So she'll be looking to see whether those numbers increase in today's announcement. And Mike, an IT consultant. Mike earns well, but as a householder, he, like all of us, has faced those higher energy prices, high costs of food and fuel and everything else, squeezing his wallet. So what does this mean today for a working person like Mike and other households? Over the course of today, we'll be doing live analysis on these particular household finances and how the budget affects them. And we'll also be going live to them to get their reaction. So let's go back to Sophie and hopefully we'll hear more for some of these people over the course of the day. Thank you very much, uh, Greg. Well, he'll be, of course, there guiding us through uh, the consumer reaction and trying to find out exactly how it impacts families across the country. Now, uh, Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister, has left number 10 uh, Downing Street. This is all part of the budget choreography. There he is. He is making his way over to the House of Commons. We'll have Prime Minister's questions, of course, uh, kicking off as usual at about 12. And then after that is when the Chancellor will be unveiling his budget. That will be live at 12.30. It's always a bit of an unusual PMQs, the one just before the budget. It's kind of like the rare occasion when the PMQs is almost like the starter before the main course. <laughs> but there is Rishi Sunak setting off uh, in his car, leaving number 10 Downing Street. So, Ed, we've been talking about childcare, but there's some other kind of consumer-facing policies, I guess, that are going to impact people even if they don't have kids. I mean, energy is still a huge issue, isn't it? It's been pretty cold recently as well. It's, it's enormous. In, in a way, I mean, I, one of the lessons we've had for the last few months is that there are two things that really matter and no one really thinks about them all that much until they kind of kick in. One is interest rates mm. and, you know, remember what's happened over the last kind of six months with interest rates, a roller coaster there, and there's more news I can tell you about in a second about on that. And the second is energy because it feeds into everything and it feeds in obviously to our bills. And on that front, uh, we do. Let me quickly show you what we what we now know because it has been it's pre-announced again. Like I, I can't think of many leakier budgets than this. They seem to be getting leakier and leakier over the over the years. But this is kind of how the energy price guarantee works. The blue bars there are just showing you what the off-gem price cap is. It's basically the, the rate at which an average household might be expected uh, to see their energy bills. And what happened in the last kind of six-month period is that. Because of really high wholesale prices, those bills were going to be way into this kind of stratosphere, heading towards kind of £4,000 for, for the average household. But instead, along came the energy price guarantee and basically kind of capped the rate. I should say the rate because it doesn't cap the absolute amount that you end up having to pay, as, as, as you will have probably experienced by now. But it does cap the rate at that £2,500 <coughs> level. And that difference there, you see those bars, the bit above the, the white line, that's basically what the government has had to pay. That's why this has been moderately expensive, but those bars were seen as being far higher before, so they haven't had to pay quite so much, which is partly why they have a bit more money to spend. It was going to be going up to £3,000, so look at that cap. And that would have meant that when those bills increased in April, everyone would have seen an increase, the average household. But instead, yes, as we've just learnt, instead... The cap's going to stay there uh, at £2,500. The big question now, though, is what happens in the future? Do they keep the cap there? Now, this was really relevant a few months ago when it looked like later on this year those bills were going to be really high, so the cap would have applied. But actually, look at those red bars. These are just forecasts, OK, for the next few months based on energy prices in the wholesale market. Actually, those have gone down and down. And now, these are the latest forecasts, as of March actually the market price is potentially going to be below where that cap is and that's why so far we've only got that extended through to the end of uh, the end of that quarter so it's basically july but if things kind of carry on as the market's suggesting at the moment that implies you don't necessarily have those really high costs the, the other thing i'm going to come back to my desk the other thing is that um i, I mentioned interest rates really interesting sophie because looking right now at what markets are pricing in for interest rates. Remember last time people were, you know, pricing in potentially 6% interest rates after that shock from the mini-budgets? Because of the scare about what's happening with banks right now, not mm. because of the UK, but obviously Silicon Valley Bank, that bank that collapsed, it did have a UK branch and there are concerns about banks in general at the moment and the economy. Look at interest rates right now. A lot of people think that maybe UK rates might peak only at about 4.25%. That's quite a big change. Only on Friday, they thought they were going to get up to about 4.75%. In the space of a few days, it's down to 4.25%. Maybe not even that. 
And that's a really big deal because, you know, for all of those who have, have mortgages yeah. and indeed anyone who has savings, you'll have seen that kind of reflected more on mortgages, it must be said, than on savings, higher interest rates. So when we're talking about cost of living crisis, ironically, something that Jeremy Hunt has nothing to do with, which is a financial crisis on the other side of the world, or not maybe financial crisis going too far, but a bank crisis in certain banks on the other side of the world, feeding into what's going on in the market, that could have as big an impact, if not more, on household spending uh, and on how much we have after, after all these costs than something like the energy price guarantee. Mm. And that could have a huge impact on not only you know, the budget on the Chancellor, but the whole premiership of Rishi Sunak, I guess. Yeah, of course. And, I mean, look, what you have to always keep front and centre in your mind is what is Rishi Sunak's bid to, to remain in number 10 after the next general election it's to get the economy growing and get people feeling like they are better off now under a Conservative government. And I have to say, when I went and did that focus group, it's Wickham. It's actually near where I grew up, so I know the area really well. It's been a Conservative seat since 1950s. I mean, it really is the true blue shires, if you like, of the, of the blue wall of the Conservatives, yeah. if you like. And what, what's beginning to happen is Keir Starmer is now trying to take bricks out of the blue wall. And, and, and the challenge for the Conservatives is to, to get voters that have stuck with them for years and years and years to keep with them. Mm. And we did a sort of straw poll in this room where I said, put your hand up uh, if you think the government or the country needs a change. And everyone put their hand wow. up. And there were, there were floating voters, but there were voters in there that had told us that they'd voted Conservative in, in the last general election. And I, I can't stress enough mm. how much pressure the government is on in the run-up to the next general election to, to make people feel that they're better off and to make people feel that the country is working, like basic services are working. But, of course, there are external factors on economy that Rishi Sunak can't control. I mean, it's a bit like, Ed, when Keir Starmer said that he wanted to make uh, the UK the... What was it? The biggest performer or the best performer... Yeah, the fastest growing mm. in the G7. In the G7. Yeah. It's like, well, you can't control what the other six do, so yeah. why make a target like that? But, but you it's, know, it's credibility yeah. as well. Probably that you picked that up in your focus group as well. You know, the government's credibility after last what happened last year, regardless of how well this yeah. goes and the, the growth... That's been really badly damaged. And the question Very is whether damaged. Rishi Sunak can repair yeah. that or whether the, the damage is done. Particularly for a, a party that's always tried to position itself as a party of economic credibility and responsibility. Yeah. Thank you both uh, very much indeed. Let's get back to Burnley, uh, shall we? We've been talking a lot with Beth there about how it really matters uh, what voters in some of these key seats think of uh, the budget. Let's go to Sam Washington. Yes, thank you very much, Sophie. Welcome back to Burnley in Lancashire. We're here at the Church on the Streets Ministries drop-in centre where people can get uh, hot food, a hot shower, uh, even a haircut if they need it. Now, those decisions that are being taken more than 200 miles away down in Westminster are going to have a material impact, aren't they, on the day-to-day -day life for families and business owners who are living here. Well, we saw their profiles up in the screen uh, by break there. I'm joined now by Linda Marshall. She's a a retired occupational therapist and Mike Holden uh, who's an IT consultant. Uh, very good morning to you. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, you're both uh, Burnley foe, can't you? Um, let's, let's talk to you, Linda, first of all. Uh, the cost of living crisis has been a real thing, hasn't it, in your life? Cost of food, you say, has doubled and it's energy bills. So what, what are you looking for from the Chancellor today? Well, energy bills are crippling us, as many people at the minute. So we're hoping that that's going to be stay capped. Um, even if it is, it's... But even if it's capped? Yes, it's it still too ease. expensive. But I dread to think what will happen if it does go up even more. Um, and also, interest rates, the mortgage rates have gone up as well, which ours has gone up since we, um, the con you know, the contract ends. Um, but for many people, that's causing, you know, they're paying double the amount of what they're paying at the minute. It's not too bad for us at the minute because we don't have a big mortgage, but for most people... Um, but you're, you're retired, your husband works full-time, yeah. and your son, yeah. who's 38, has had to move back in with you yeah. because his costs were too expensive. Yes, he lived in Digsbury, Manchester, for seven years. Good job, whereas as a technical engineer, 
um, was paying a thousand pound a month for rent for his apartment. All the money he had coming in, even though he was getting a very good wage, right, so he's had to come back, back to you. Out. So he's come back home to help us out as well because he, he you know. Well, let, let me bring in Mike. I know yeah. we've all got to know each other, haven't we, this morning. Uh, Mike, you, if you don't mind me describing you like this, um, you're at the better off end of, of people I, I in Burnley, so. and, and you still say that you're also feeling the pinch. You're an IT yes, consultant, uh, steady all. job. Yes, I've, I've been in a steady job for many years. Uh, I'm on a good salary and I've got a good pension lined up, but um, our day-to-day -day costs have doubled in the last 12 months. Uh, fuel costs, as, as everybody knows, have gone up 50% in the last 12 months. Um, and you're on the road a lot? Uh, yes, and uh, the fuel fuel and uh, heating and electricity costs are all uh, going through the roof. And, um, and you saw the value of your pension because you're coming close to the time when you'll be drawing it down. Yeah. Uh, you were a victim of what happened with the mini-budget from Liz Truss. Yes, Liz Truss's intervention cost me a uh, am I allowed to say it? About £60,000 in, in lost pension uh, part, uh, so, like 12 months ago. So what are you looking for today? Uh, my concern is, is not for myself. Uh, I'm comfortably off. Uh, if uh, fuel bills stay as they are, uh, I, I can survive. Uh, if they go up, uh, I can take the, the hit a little bit. Uh, I'm concerned for the people of Burnley. People here are on minimum wage and can't afford to heat homes. Uh, and they can't afford to feed the kids. And I'm hoping to help, help with, with those people rather than for myself. I, I will ride over the bumps and I've got a, a retirement coming up. In a few years, I mean, I'm, a few years in me yet, but um, I, I'm more concerned for the people of Burnley who are around us here. Do you feel Burnley's been forgotten about? Very much so. Um, um, over the, a number of years, um, Manufacturing's in decline here, or it's picking back up a little bit now, but it's been in decline for years. Uh, and this corridor, Burnley, Blackburn and Blackpool, uh, of uh, suffering the highest inflation in the country uh, and the lowest wage rises. And it concerns me. I know there's supposed to be help for childcare coming up, which is going to be very welcome if it comes. Uh, not, not for myself, because, again, I have a stepdaughter, but we have family to help with her. Um, but um, people in, in the town of Burnley really have had it very hard for a very long time. All right. Uh, well, Linda and Mike are going to be uh, staying with us throughout the programme. We're going to be watching the budget together and joined by a few more people. And we'll be talking about what we heard, uh, perhaps even what we didn't hear uh, after the Chancellor has delivered his speech. Of course, uh, the needs for people of Burnley, as you can see here, this drop-in centre, people who need food, uh, people who need a hot shower, uh, people who need mental health support. Uh, it's an acute need here. So, of course, we will be keeping a close eye uh, on that and we'll be bringing you all of our thoughts throughout the afternoon. Back to you, Sophie. Thank you very much indeed, Sam. Now, we do have a little bit of news to bring you ahead of the budget, ahead of our uh, PMQ's uh, panel, that we are going to be with you in the build-up, of course, uh, to the prime, usual Prime Minister's questions. But we have had a bit of a readout from Cabinet today. It was an earlier Cabinet than usual, 8.30am uh, this morning, so bright and early, and I can just bring you uh, what the Chancellor said. Uh, he set out the improved economic picture, which he said was following his autumn statement, saying that paved the way for his growth budget. So clearly being dubbed a growth budget today. He also referenced plans for deregulation, uh, plans to invest billions in carbon capture and storage and nuclear energy, and a boost to levelling up through those 12 investment zones across the UK. He also outlined